Hi, welcome everyone uh, to another webinar from the Beef Reproduction Task Force. My name is Vitor Mercadente. I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist here at Virginia Tech. And I'm currently the chair of the Beef Reproduction Task Force. Um, we've been doing this webinar series uh, over the spring every third Tuesday of the month. Um, and we've been very happy with the you know, everybody joining us and we have had people from across the country, from different countries. So it's been a really, really nice um, you know, opportunity to share some, some of the you know, programs that we have, some of the uh, speakers sharing some of the latest technologies and some of the best ma uh, management practices from beef cattle uh, reproduction. So today is not gonna be any different. Um, we have two other speakers with me. We're gonna be sharing kind of the, um, the, the stage here today, and then I'm um, gonna be hopefully more than enough time for a lot of a Q and A session um, to make sure that we answer as many questions as we can from you guys. But I wanna start um, thanking our sponsor for today's webinar, uh, who is Mark Animal Health. And we're gonna play a, a short little video uh, from Mark. And while we're doing that, uh, we're going to try something different today. So if you can, on the, on the chat box, write where you're from, you know, which state or country. And then if you're doing AI, NET or AI or just ET, write that down in the chat so we can take a look at, uh, see what you guys are doing and get a sense from where people um, are watching us. Okay. So let me, I'm going to start sharing. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to play. And I played the, the commercial, uh, the little short clip from Mark, okay? The Sand Hills of Nebraska is where you'll find Keneally Angus, a family-run seed stock operation. I'm a fourth generation uh, rancher. Uh, there's the sixth generation living on the ranch right now. Um, we started, my father started in 1960 um, with 20 purebred Angus heifers. When Angus breed was, uh, wasn't very popular. We uh, run about 3,000 registered cows. Um, we market them, market bulls primarily through two production sales every year, um, one in November and one in March. At Keneally Angus, taking care of the cattle includes a strong focus on reproduction management. They use artificial insemination to breed all their cows. Fertility and reproduction on any cow-calf operation is paramount to success and profitability and uh, more so on our deal because we are supplying genetics to commercial cattlemen that need that leg up in, in uh, their daily operation. We AI the cows one time on a synchronization. We synchronize all the cows and uh, we do that and able to concentrate our labor. We're out on uh, big country a lot of the times and big pastures and, and uh, checking natural heats is, is not very feasible sometimes. So we're able to synchronize and uh, concentrate our efforts on, on different groups at different times. Recently, Fertigil from Merck Animal Health received expanded indications for use in beef cows. Already approved for use with Estromate to synchronize heat cycles to allow for fixed time AI in dairy cows, the new label enables the two products to be used on label in beef breeding programs. Fertigil, is, it's a product that's been around for a long time. It's been utilized a lot in the dairy sector. Uh, it's been utilized in fixed time AIs. The purpose of GNRH is to help stimulate that ovulation. So uh, as, we, as we look at the, the use of this product in a fixed time program, we use Estromate to create the heat and we use GNRH at the time to try to stimulate the ovulation. The two of them working together is, is what helps us accomplish these synchronization programs. And what we found with the use of, of Estromate is the longer half-life than we see with some of the other prostaglandins on the market. As we're starting to, to try to manipulate this cycle, the longer half-life, the longer opportunity that drug has to act. We hear that we're getting better results as far as trying to stimulate, uh, to try to stimulate ovulation or to stimulate heats in these animals. We use uh, Estromate and Fertigil as part of our synchronization protocols and have had very good success with that. As many variables as we deal with in a synchronization protocol and with Mother Nature, having a, uh, having a product that you're comfortable with and that's very consistent is uh, is a big piece of the puzzle 
there's a million different challenges out there. So as many variables as we can take out of it by having the right product uh, increases our success rate. Bottom line, improved management of reproduction in the cow herd equals a more uniform calf crop and the opportunity for greater value on sale day. In the Nebraska Sandhills, I'm Brian Baxter reporting. All right. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, right before we started, about asking um, you guys to share where you're from and if you're doing AI, and I really like that. It's amazing. Um, I don't know if it, it it's not all there, but I believe there's somebody from Australia. <laughs> so that's amazing. I guess good morning to you there. Um, so um, really, really nice to see people from all over uh, the country, people from other, con uh, other countries as well. So welcome again. Um, for those of you guys that just joined us, uh, my name is Vitor Mercadante. And together today with uh, Dr. Joe Dalton, who's at the University of Idaho and is also a beef reproduction task member, and Dr. Pedro Fontes from the University of Georgia, we're going to be uh, sharing some information on embryo and uh, semen from bovine and how to handle so that we can get the best results. So um, throughout the talk, please make sure that you use the Q&A uh, tab, not the chat, uh, to enter your questions and um, we'll make sure to answer them uh, towards the end for a Q&A combined from the three uh, speakers, okay? So Joe, thank you for being here and uh, if you wanna share a screen and the floor is yours. Okay. Very good, welcome everyone to our webinar tonight, uh, Handling Semen and Embryos for Optimal Fertility. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad to see so many different people from not only the US, but from around the world. We're gonna start out with uh, a, a basic kind of diagram here of the semen storage tank. And it's really important that we are familiar with uh, the tools that we use. And in the case of the semen storage tank, uh, many times we're not really all that familiar with how it's constructed and that can lead to damage and that can lead to loss of nitrogen and potentially uh, loss of contents in the tank. So we're going to spend a moment just going over how the liquid nitrogen tank is constructed. And as we can see here, we have an outer tank and on the inside of that outer tank, there is a vacuum space and some insulation. Okay, and then let's see if I can get my uh, pointer here. Here we go. So we have an outer tank shown here. We have insulation material here, and there's a vacuum pulled on that at the factory. And then we have an inside tank here. And the inside tank is the one that's gonna hold the liquid nitrogen. And then we have canisters, usually six or eight canisters that hang down from the neck into the liquid nitrogen. And we have a neck tube here. And the neck tube is really, really important for a variety of things. And one of the main things we want to uh, be careful about is not in damaging the neck. The neck can be easily damaged and can cause then premature loss of liquid nitrogen and warming of the tank. So we wanna be careful, even though the tanks look very, very sturdy and are sturdy, it's not something we wanna be launching into the back of the pickup truck or uh, dropping on the floor. Okay, we wanna be very careful so that we can uh, protect our investment of genetics, whether it be embryos or uh, semen within the tank. Okay, within the canister here is where the canes of semen or where embryos would be stored. And uh, over here off on the right hand side, I have a picture of a cane. This is a cane and the cane ha generally has two goblets, an upper goblet and a lower goblet. And I'm showing 5.5 ml straws 
which would be loaded in the goblet, and then the goblet is snapped onto the top of the cane. The same thing's done for this bottom portion of the cane, and it would look like this then assembled. We would have a cane that has two goblets, 10 straws total, and then this cane would be stored within this canister. And we can see uh, just barely the cane tops up here. Uh, within this canister. And then the canister, as I mentioned, hangs down from the neck and is numbered and it hangs down into the liquid nitrogen. The last point I wanna make about this is we have to really be careful with the amount of liquid nitrogen in the tank. And we always wanna maintain about six inches of liquid nitrogen in the tank. We wanna fill the tank at regular intervals and this has actually become much easier now that we can get on a schedule. We can do this on our phones, we can do this in calendars and get on a schedule with our representative to have the representative come by um, when we need liquid nitrogen. We can also use a dipstick to measure liquid nitrogen and we should do that at regular intervals to make sure that we are not prematurely losing the liquid nitrogen. So every successful AI program begins with proper semen handling. And there's really four things that we need to remember. And they are time, temperature, hygiene, and skill. Relative to temperature, we're showing a diagram here of the neck of a liquid nitrogen tank. Now I already talked about how that can be sensitive to damage if we mishandle a tank. But we have to also recognize that as we have liquid nitrogen within the tank down here, the neck of the tank, as we get closer to the outside, the neck of the tank actually warms up and that makes perfect sense. Liquid nitrogen is going to be about well, minus 196 degrees C, greater than minus 320 uh, Fahrenheit. And that's what we're showing here is Fahrenheit. And you can see that as we go from about the bottom of the neck, where we're at about minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit, by the time we get halfway through the neck, now we're at minus 100 degrees approximately to 100, minus 116 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that may seem like it's very cold and it is very cold still, but look how quickly the temperature warms up. Now we're only at minus 40 and minus 51 degrees. And at one inch below the top of the tank, we're at plus five degrees Fahrenheit to minus eight and then we're going to rapidly approach ambient temperature at the top of the neck of the tank. And really the take home message from all this is, is the effect on this temperature gradient on sperm cells. And we know from previous research that sperm injury occurs at about minus 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And that would be approximately in the middle of this tank's neck. And we also need to recognize that injury to sperm cannot be corrected by returning semen to liquid nitrogen. Sperm do not have mechanisms to be able to uh, repair injuries. So essentially what happens is if we use poor semen handling and raise the cane too far up in the neck, the straw that we remove is not really the one we're worried about. It's the remaining straws in that neck that haven't been chosen and go back into the liquid nitrogen and then the next time are mishandled and the next time are mishandled. And then the injuries become additive. So we always wanna work below the frost line and the frost line, although it will vary based on level of liquid nitrogen, in the tank, the frost line generally is in about the 50% zone of most tanks' necks. OK, 
Okay, so we wanna be below the frost line to minimize sperm injury. This Joe. is a gr graphic of that. Hey, Joe. And, yes. Sorry, I didn't wanna, sorry to interrupt. Um, it's showing a little window on your slides as you're sharing the entire screen. See if oh. you can, I don't know if you can move that. Oh, there you go, perfect. Get rid of it? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Vitor. Sorry about that. Okay, so now we are showing, uh, looking into the tank, looking into a canister with two uh, canes in it. And the blue line is showing where the frost line is. Okay, and I have the canister positioned below the frost line so that I'm working below the frost line. And this would be one of the canes that I could choose to work with because there are straws we can see right here that are still in the safe zone below the frost line. There are no straws in this particular cane in the upper goblet because there's no goblet right there. Um, so that just kind of gives you a visual of what I mean about the frost line of working below the frost line. Uh, personally, I would use long nose tweezers and they work very well to access these straws and we can keep the whole group of straws below the frost line. When we remove those straws, we're gonna remove those straws in one motion and put them in a pre-warmed thaw bath shown here. And we're gonna thaw straws at 95 to 98 degrees Fahrenheit in warm water or 35 to 37 degrees Celsius for 45 seconds. Okay, so in one motion, pull the straw out, it goes into the thaw bath. The canister that I was holding is put back down into the tank. The tank is buttoned up and I have an AI gun that I've been keeping warm so that I can ultimately load the thawed straw in into a warmed gun. At all times, we are going to protect the straws. So when I remove the straw from the thaw bath, I'll have a paper towel in my hand. As that's shown here on the left, we can see the paper towel. The straw goes into the paper towel. We protect the straw from any sorts of insults, whether it's extreme temperature, whether it's light, whether it's wind, dirt, dust, and also water. We're using the straw to dry the towel off because water kills sperm. So we're gonna dry that uh, sper uh, straw off. We're gonna make sure it stays protected. And then we're gonna appropriately load it in the gun, cut the tip off. Alternatively, it can be loaded in a pre-warmed sheath that is protected. And after it's cut, it could be loaded into that pre-warm sheath and then the gun mated with the sheath. Okay, there's a couple of variety of ways of, of doing that. We're going to want to maintain the temperature at all times as we work and as we go towards the animals. So that's shown here. Uh, this particular technician is carrying a battery pack um, AI gun warmer. Okay, these can have a dial, they have a battery, they can be dialed in to 95 to 98 degrees, 35 to 37 degrees. Uh, they work very, very well. Okay, alternatively, uh, many of you will remember being taught like I was taught, uh, take the gun and put the gun very close to yourself within your coveralls and use your own body heat to maintain the temperature of the gun. So a little bit more about the time and the temperature. We know from research of half male semen straws that were thawed appropriately and then held for 15 minutes at 35 degrees C or 95 to 98 degrees Fahrenheit, that there's no difference in progressive sperm motility across time. So if we thaw semen appropriately, and maintain the temperature, in general, there's no 
loss of motility for about 15 minute window. However, if we thaw half male semen straws appropriately, but then we hold them for 15 minutes at a lower temperature, 22 degrees C, which is approximately room temperature in the low 70s for Fahrenheit, there is a decrease in sperm motility across time. Okay, so that's not what we want to do. We want to maintain temperature because when we maintain temperature across time from the time it's thawed until the time it gets in the cow, then we can have more optimal fertility. Hygiene is pretty self-explanatory. This is about the only slide I think I have on hygiene. Uh, very important, of course, that we're wiping off the vulva of the cow prior to insertion of a clean gun, which has a clean sheath, a unique sheath on it. And in one motion, after wiping the vulva, we're removing the AI gun and the AI gun goes immediately in the cow. Okay, we're not wiping the AI gun around and, and taking our time. It goes immediately in one motion into the cow and away we go. Moving on to skill. Okay, the target for artificial insemination of uh, deposition in cattle is the body of the uterus shown here. Uh, just anterior, just cranial to the opening of the cervix here. Okay, the interior opening of the cervix. That would be the goal is to deposit in the uterine body. Having said that, how does deposition of semen into the cervix affect fertility? So not being able to pass the cervix and depositing semen within the cervix. There's some very elegant research that was done that showed a 10% decrease in fertility in cervical deposition when compared to deposition in the uterine body. And unfortunately, there have been retraining sessions that has documented cervical deposition of semen to occur in about 20% of attempted uterine body depositions. So we always want to be cognizant of where's the tip of the gun? Have I passed the entire cervix yet? Am I in the uterine body? Can I feel about a quarter of an inch or so of the AI gun in the uterine body? And if so, then I'm able to deposit in the uterine body. If I can feel an inch, two inches, three inches of the gun, I've gone too far, I wanna back up, if I can't feel the tip and I kind of am stopped, the tip is kind of stopped, likely it's in the cervix. And I'm gonna to want to continue to appropriately manipulate the cervix on the gun so that I can reach the desired location for deposition, which is the uterine body. So one of the questions that we get quite a lot especially as we get to breeding many cows in time to AI situations is, how many straws should be thawed at one time? We did some research a few years back where we asked technicians to thaw four straws simultaneously and keep track of the time until they got to the first cow and the fourth cow, the completion of the first cow and the fourth cow. There's nothing magical about four straws. It's just a number that we happen to choose, okay? And the way this table is, is set up is we have sequential AI number here on the left and uh, the first straw and the fourth straw. We had two types of inseminators. We had professional inseminators who were inseminators that had a root and were going from dairy to dairy to dairy. And we had herdsmen or do-it-yourself inseminators that were on that particular farm only. And you can see from when the first straw hit the water is when the time 
uh, elapsed. And for professionals and for herdsmen, they were both able to thaw four straws, load the guns, get to the animals, and complete the first insemination within about five to six minutes. Okay, so working very efficiently relative to time. And to complete the fourth insemination, you can see for professionals, it took almost eight minutes. And for herdsmen, it took almost 11 minutes. Okay, so still working uh, fairly efficiently relative to time. Okay. What was the effect of sequential insemination number on conception rates on fertility? We, we talked about the time aspect and they were able to complete four inseminations in less than 11 minutes. And essentially this is set up where we have conception rate on this axis, we have sequential insemination number or AI1, AI2, three and four, and the orange, bars show the professional technicians, the maroon bars show the herd, herdsmen or do-it-yourselfers. And if we can see that there's no effect of sequential insemination number on conception rates, whether they were professional technicians or whether they were herdsmen. However, we did notice a difference in fertility level between professional technicians and herdsmen in this particular data set. In a much larger data set that was put together by Mel DeJarnett from Select Sires, and you can see the, the data shown here, sequential insemination numbers one through four, with thousands of inseminations, we see no effect on fertility, whether it's insemination one, two, three, or four. So we're gonna get back to the original question. How many straws should be thawed at one time? The rule of thumb is no more that can, than can be used in 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, we wanna maintain the motility, we wanna maintain the viability of those sperm cells. And that's why we wanna use the rule of no more than can be used in 10 to 15 minutes. More importantly, every technician should know their comfort zone. I might be able to only load two efficiently and be able to breed two animals in 10 to 15 minutes. Someone else might be able to do more than four. So they're gonna to need to know their comfort zone and keep track of their results. It's very important not to allow straws to touch when thawing because straws can quickly re-freeze and then when they break apart and thaw, it damages sperm cells. So that's where multiple thaw baths come into uh, practice. It's entirely possible you can use multiple thaw baths to thaw multiple straws and then that way you don't have straws touching each other and you don't have reduced fertility. We wanna remember time, temperature, hygiene, and skill are the four important things for uh, success in semen handling and AI. One of the things we haven't mentioned is specifically looking at sex semen. And this graph here or this figure here shows progressive motility of sex semen after thawing at 35 to 37 degrees C. So we're thawing the semen appropriately, but then it's going to be either held at 37 degrees C, that's the green line, at 42 degrees C, that would be heat shock, and that's the yellow line, or this red line, which is 4.4 degrees C, which is cold shock. Okay, we have progressive motility on this axis shown here. And then we have time since thawed in minutes for the determination of the progressive motility. And as we can see that 
essentially the best situation is shown by maintenance of temperature, the same as was thawing, 35, 37 degrees. We see very little decline in progressive motility across 15 minutes. Within the heat shock category, you can see a larger decline. And within the cold shock category, we see an even greater decline in motility across time. So what does this tell us? Functionally, this tells us the 10 to 15 minute window that I talked about previously is for conventional semen, conventional semen, because we don't want to have issues over here. What we want to do is we want to move to the left and appropriately minimize potential issues. So we're talking about five to eight minutes is the appropriate window using the uh, best semen handling uh, techniques for sex semen, okay? And that just makes sense. Conventional semen is one product. There's a set of data that goes with that. Sex semen is altogether another product, a highly processed product that another suggested window of time is what we're making, five, about five to eight minutes. So we wanna thaw no more than we can use in five to eight minutes. Take home messages, time, temperature, hygiene, and skill. Pay attention to those, pay attention to detail, and we can all have very good results with conventional and with sex semen in artificial insemination of our cattle. Thank you very much. And I will, if I can figure out how to stop sharing. Okay, am I still sharing, Vitor? No, you're good, thank you so much. Okay. All right, Pedro, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Sure. I remind everybody um, that during the talks, you can type your questions in the Q&A tab, and then we'll, we'll get to answer those at the end, okay? But the Peter Fontes, floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks, Victor, and, and hello, everyone. Um, so now the next, um, over the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to... Uh, give everyone a brief overview um, of Amber evaluation. So the idea is to talk about some of the handling aspects related to uh, Amber programs, right? Amber transfer programs. So Amber evaluation is a big component of that. And then I'm also gonna try to touch a little bit about, um, uh, talk a little bit about Amber freezing as well as the process of um, um, thawing embryos out for direct transfer. Um, and try to you know pinpoint some of the things that you know you might see your embryologist working with, um, and try to touch on some of the things that might potentially be influencing fertility in our embryo transfer programs. Um, so as we think about um, you know getting optimal results in an embryo transfer program, one thing that is important for us to be mindful of is that you know um, the actual embryo handling uh, it's a component that plays a role in the success of an embryo transfer program, but it's only uh, one piece of the puzzle, right? Uh, and from an embryo practitioner standpoint, one of the main challenges is that a lot of the factors that are gonna be influencing pregnancy rates for an embryo transfer programs are actually not up to the control of the practitioner itself, right? It's um, a lot of it is related to management factors. Um, and there's some good resources in the Beef Reproduction Task Force um, previous proceedings um, published at, at, at their website and um, that, you know, we, we can go in and find some, some management factors that we can incorporate uh, in order to maximize embryo transfer success. And, and again, um, the handling of the embryo itself is just one piece of that. So um, as I go through my slides here, I, I just wanted to, you know, put a disclaimer out there. And I think this is really true in the embryo transfer industry. Um, 
which is my way is not the only way, right? Uh, if you if you go around and talk to people that are transferring a lot of embryos, everybody does things a little bit different. So as go as I go here and I share um, some of the techniques that we use and some of the literature that is out there, um, keep in mind this is not the only way of of, of accomplishing things uh, from an embryo transfer standpoint. And and one of the big drawbacks as you think about trying to understand um, how some of those handling embryo handling aspects are influencing fertility in those embryo transfer programs. It is really hard for us to generate data uh, from a controlled trial um, standpoint and try to pinpoint exactly how specific things that we do from an embryo handling standpoint influence fertility. But we do have some pretty good resources from, uh, from, from, from the industry, right? With uh, retrospective analysis of uh, things that people are doing out there in the field and how those are relating to fertility, right? So I'll share some of these today uh, as we think about some of the methods that we're gonna be handling those embryos and what we can do to minimize the risk of potentially you know, decreasing fertility in our programs. So um, a big component of embryo handling is of course, uh, evaluating embryos, right? So when we go there and super ovulate a donor or if we're producing embryos through IVF, you know, we got to be able to go through those embryos and sort them out based on, on some morphological characteristics, right? And that's that's when uh, evaluation of embryos come in handy, come in hand. And you know, as you look through uh, standardized recommendations for embryo evaluations, usually uh, the evaluation of embryos are going to be divided in three main parts. Okay, so the first part, part and the first thing we try to do is usually differentiate embryos from unfertilized uh, oocytes or so UFOs. So once we differentiated those, we, we usually go through our embryos and uh, assign those embryos a developmental stage score, okay? Once we determine the developmental stage of those embryos, uh, we move forward and then assign a, a quality grade for those embryos. And we use both um, the developmental stage and the quality of that embryo to make decisions with regards to whether we're gonna freeze those embryos or whether we're gonna transfer them fresh or uh, whether we're actually not gonna transfer that embryo, right? So. You know, and as you think about good and proper embryo evaluation, um, and, and mainly for folks that are learning how to um, evaluate embryos, you know, and, and if you're potentially going through an embryo transfer course or, or something similar, you know, training is really important and experience uh, when it comes to uh, embryo grading, okay? But not only that, uh, one thing that I want to draw your attention to, bring your attention to is the quality of equipment, right? So. Uh, Having a good stereoscope really plays a big role on, on, on proper um, embryo evaluation. I'm gonna show you some examples here, okay? So usually when you look at the uh, International Embryo Transfer Society manual recommendations for embryo evaluation, um, embryos will be assigned two different numbers, okay? So the first number, it's uh, related to the stage of development of that embryo. Uh, so usually that number is gonna range from one to nine with one being an unfertilized oocyte and nine being uh, expanded, um, expanding hatch blastocyst, okay? And then our second number uh, is gonna be the quality of that end, okay? Which is gonna range from one to four, with one being an excellent or, or good quality embryo and four being a degenerated embryo, okay? And I'm gonna show you some examples of those. So here I have a diagram from the IETS manual with the different uh, embryo developmental stages going all the way from uh, uh, score one here uh, to nine, okay, with one being an unfertilized oocyte. So as we move forward, uh, we have a stage development two, so which refers to embryos that are either in a two cell stage all the way into a 12 cell stage, okay. Um, and, you know, as we move forward and those embryos, uh, you, you notice that Basically, as those embryos progress and develop, and they're undergoing mitosis, which means that those uh, blastomeres or those uh, embryonic cells here are undergoing mitotic division, right? So they're just splitting here. However, when we get to uh, a morula stage here, you can see these clusters of cells here, okay? At a morula stage, that embryo, uh, if we go there and apply some molecular techniques to the, those, those blastomere here, blastomeres here, we notice that they're already starting to function a little bit differently, okay? So those cells are already starting to differentiate themselves, okay? So this will be what we call developmental stage of four. 
And then when we start seeing the formation of what we call a blastocell or a fluid field cavity within that embryo, that's what we would call a developmental stage five or an early blastocyst. So as the blastocell develops, and once it occupies at least uh, more than 50% of that um, embryonic structure here, we have what we would define a, a, as a stage development six, so a blastocyst. And then as that blastocyst expands and we see, um, you can notice that the zona pellucida here is trying to get thinner, okay? So this is what we would call an expanded blastocyst. So once that embryo goes there and hatch from that zona pellucida, we have a hatch blastocyst. And as it keeps growing, we will call that an expanded uh, hatch blastocyst, okay? So uh, a few things to keep in mind here, usually uh, when you have an embryo reaching a developmental stage of eight, those embryos are not uh, recommended for freezing, um, uh, neither recommended for exports as well. So these are things you keep in mind as well. And usually when you have embryos, so we're gonna be conventionally flushing donors at day seven for the most part. Uh, and at that stage, if you have anything, um, things like uh, an early morula at that stage, at day seven, that embryo is very likely uh, an embryo that it's um, already um, halted their development. So it's that embryo that we would deem as non-feasible for, for transfer as well, okay? So basically when we have an embryology uh, helping us, you know, flush our donor cows and going through uh, those embryos, these are some of the things that they're looking at from a developmental standpoint. And here I have uh, the exact same um, layout, but here I have some actual pictures of embryos. Uh, but you can see those embryos going all the way from a developmental stage of one, all the way to a hatch blastocyst here with a developmental stage of nine, okay? So you can see how much bigger this blastocyst is, this hatch blastocyst is, and here you have the zona pellucida, which was surrounding that embryo earlier, but it reached a certain stage of development in which that embryo actually hatched that zona pellucida and it actually popped out of that zona pellucida, okay? So this is embryos, uh, embryo evaluation from a developmental stage standpoint. But like I said earlier, we're also gonna be assigning a quality grade of those embryos, right? And those quality grades are gonna range from one to four. And in this table here, um, you can see, I have here the e, uh, IETS grade here on the left side, okay? Here we have the description of the quality of the embryo. And here we have the percentage of viable cells, okay? This is usually one of the things that we, uh, we mostly are paying attention to when we're assigning grades to those embryos, but keep in mind that we're looking for more factors than only the percentage of viable cells, okay? So if you're thinking about an embryo that we call quality grade one, okay, that embryo should have at least 85% 85% or more of its cells viable, okay? Um, and as we move from an embryo uh, quality grade of one to a, a grade of two, Usually we're talking about embryos that have between 50 and 85% of their cells viable. Okay, and this is the image that I have here on the right. So you notice here in this embryonic structure here, here's a morula uh, on the left side here. And here on the right, you can see some degenerated cells. Okay, and notice that those degenerated cells do not represent more than 50% of, that, uh, uh, of the cells of that embryo. So based on that, we will assign a grade of two to this embryo here. Uh, as opposed to a, a grade one embryo here, you can see a nice embryo with no uh, generated cells present here, okay? As we move from a grade two to a three, uh, usually we're talking about embryos that are in poor quality, around 25% of uh, their cells are viable. And then when we go below 25% of viable cells, we usually, uh, we, we will be grading those embryos uh, as, a, as a degenerated embryo, which in, in this case here, uh, we're not even gonna be considering transferring those embryos fresh. Okay, uh, usually uh, most embryologists are gonna um, transfer all the way to uh, grade three embryos for fresh transfers, okay? And recommendations for uh, freezing embryos is usually, uh, embryos that are classified as suitable for freezing is usually limited to embryos that receive a grade one or two. And again, those embryos have to be in a uh, proper developmental stage based on the day that we're flushing those cows or, or based on the age of their embryo in a in vitro production system. But again, keep in mind that when an embryologist is going through the embryos, uh, they're looking way more things than just simply the percentage of viable cells, right? Uh, the percentage of viable cells give us a good understanding, but there are several other parameters that are important that I have them laid out here 
uh, that we're going to be looking at as we're sorting those embryos and, and as we're determining what we're actually going to be doing uh, to those embryos beta, based on that uh, um, embryonic evaluation. So, you know, embryo grading is almost similar to uh, uh, body condition scoring in cows, right? There's some subjectivity to it. I would say it's probably less subjective than body condition scoring in cows, but there is some subjectivity to it. And, you know, sometimes we're going to be transferring some embryos that we consider grade one embryo, and, and that embryo is not going to result in a successful pregnancy. Whereas sometimes we're going to be transfer a grade three embryos that actually is going to uh, result in a successful pregnancy. So, but, you know, even though there's some limitations to this technique from, from, from a commercial application, you know, the current system that we have for embryo grading works really well. Um, I'm gonna to try to show you some data to, 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 to bring that uh, case. So basically here I have some um, uh, data for our in vivo uh, embryo produced embryos. Uh, here we have both fresh and thawed embryos and frozen thawed embryos, okay? With different grades ranging from one all the way to four, okay? And then here we have the pregnancy rates. And as you can see, as we uh, increase our grade, so remember, uh, the lower the grade, the better the quality of the embryo. So as we increase our grade here, okay, because the quality of that embryo decreases, the actual pregnancy rates to uh, embryo transfer also decreases. And this is true in both uh, fresh transfer setting, okay, as well as situations where we're transferring frozen embryos, okay, which pretty much shows that that uh, uh, morphological evaluation, even though somewhat subjective, it works really well and we can sort those embryos based on the ability of those embryos to actually yield a successful pregnancy. And those were, uh, the slide that I showed you previously, it was data generated in vivo. Now here I have some uh, data generated with in vitro produced embryos comparing grade one and grade two embryos and you can see very similar results, right? Uh, embryos that are being assigned a grade one, they're yielding greater pregnancy rates when you compare to embryos that are assigned um, a grade two, okay? So regardless of the, the, the method that we're utilizing to generate those embryos, that grading system uh, from a quality standpoint really works well. So now I wanted to bring back that idea of the quality of the equipment, right? So here we have uh, uh, on the right here, I have two images um, of uh, structures that were recovered on day seven, okay? And here on uh, the image on the left, it's actually an fertilized oocyte or uh, one cell structure. And then here on the right side, uh, we have a stage four good quality, really good quality uh, compacted morula, which will be an embryo that would be suitable for transfer. And as you can see, if you're in a situation where you don't have a good quality uh, stereo microscope, you know, you might run into issues of improperly um, assigning the wrong grade to the embryo. So for example, if you're considering a stage one, um, embryo, a, a, a compacted moral, and we're transferring that embryo, we know that that's not going to result in a successful pregnancy. And at the same time, if you look at a moral and we, we, we classify that moral as a, a UFO, um, we're going to run, you know, we're going to be missing the opportunity of generating a successful pregnancy from that good quality embryo. So for the most part, folks, uh, embryologists are going to be um, looking and searching embryos at a 10 to 15 magnification. And usually when, once we go there and find those embryos and we are trying to assign a grade of those embryos, we're going to be actually zooming in into those embryos uh, uh, with at least uh, a 50 times magnification in order to properly evaluate the morphology of those embryos and, and assign a, a, a development and a grade score. Okay. Um, one of the things that we get asked a lot is regard to conditions of embryo storage. Uh, so for example, if you go there and we have a big group of, uh, of donors uh, to flush in the same day, you know, sometimes those embryos, they, they sit in the holding media for uh, a few hours, right? And, and there's always a concern, uh, both from embryologists as well as producers, um, with regards to how long can those embryos uh, stay there um, in that holding media. Uh, in an ambient temperature sourcing. And there, there, there's some uh, data here, and this is a pretty good resource in the ARSPC proceedings uh, that shows some of the, the impacts of some of our handling techniques on, on pregnancy rates for embryo transfer. But basically here we have um, the effect of the time in which those embryos stayed in the holding media at room temperature. Um, 
as it comes to as it relates to pregnancy rates. And you can see that those embryos, uh, if they were all the way into almost 24 hours here in the range of 19 to 24 hours, um, they, if they were transferred fresh, those embryos are yielding some pretty good pregnancy rates. Okay, so no significant differences here. Uh, if those embryos stay for a few hours uh, in holding media uh, at room temperature. But one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, there are a few studies that suggest that uh, the same is not applicable for when we're actually freezing embryos, okay? So we, there, there, there are some studies that shows that embryos that were held for 12 hours before freezing uh, were less likely to survive the freezing process when compared to embryos that were held for two hours, okay? But on the other hand, there are some studies that evaluated from 10 all the way to 180 minutes after collection. And in that study, this specific study, they saw no differences um, in, in the storage time uh, and pregnancy rates to frozen embryos. So, you know, the way that I interpret this is that, you know, we're talking about 180 minutes here, so no more than three hours. So if we're Thinking about freezing embryos, you should think, be thinking about processing those embryos a little bit faster, uh, as opposed to when we are in a situation that we know we're gonna be able to transfer all those embryos fresh. So whenever transferring fresh embryos, there's some more flexibility there. Whenever we're actually freezing those embryos, we should try to focus on trying to process those embryos and start the freezing process, you know, uh, within a few hours after we, we, we recover those embryos from the donors. Um, from a cryopreservation standpoint, um, Common recommendation is to uh, use only grade one and grade two embryos for cryopreservation, okay? And from a stage of development standpoint, it's not uh, as big of a concern when we're doing a day seven flush, okay? Because we know that the majority of the um, embryos that are gonna receive a grade one and two that are flushed on day seven, uh, they're gonna be at a stage of development in which uh, we're gonna have adequate uh, survival rates through the cryopreservation process. With an exception uh, should be made whenever we're dealing with embryos that, with situation where we're flushing embryos uh, on day eight, because very often on day eight, we're gonna see a little bit more of those uh, hatch blastocysts. And we know that those hatch blastocysts, uh, the results for hatch blastocysts from a freezing cryopreservation standpoint tend to go down, okay? As we think about the cryoprotectants and, 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 and techniques that we have available, um, most embryos today, if not pretty much all of them, are going to be uh, frozen, at least from a, a slow rate freezing process, are going to be frozen uh, using ethylene glycol. Back in the day, we used to use a lot uh, of glycerol, but uh, the process of thawing the glycerol, uh, frozen, the embryos that were frozen using glycerol as a cryoprotectant was a little bit harder. Uh, whereas with uh, ethylene glycol, it allows you to perform direct transfer. So this is probably the most commonly used method, uh, at least from a slow uh, rate freezing standpoint. Uh, usually when we're, um, so usually no, whenever we're freezing embryos, we're going to be loading those embryos in a um, uh, quarter cc straw, okay? And basically here's a diagram with the, with the layout of a straw. So here we have the straw plug on the left side, okay? And basically when we're pulling those embryos, after those embryos achieve uh, equilibrium with the, uh, with the cryopreservant, in, the, in our case here, ethylene glycol, we're basically gonna pull a, a little bit of frozen medium. And then we're gonna have an air pocket followed by a little bit more frozen medium. And in the second column of frozen medium, of, of freezing medium, sorry, uh, then we're going to be pulling, we're going to have the embryo placed in there, okay? Then we're going to pull another air pocket again, followed by another um, a column of uh, freezing medium again, medium again, and then we're going to seal the, the other end here of our uh, embryo straw. And again, we're going to be using uh, predominantly a um, quarter cc straw, okay? So uh, from a slow rate freezing standpoint, when we're utilizing ethylene glycol, um, Usually, you know, as we think about that process, we're gonna be first, you know, uh, putting that embryo after we rinse and clean that embryo a few times, we're gonna be uh, placing that embryo within uh, with, a, with, a, with our cryoprotectant and wait until that embryo achieve equilibrium. This is uh, performed at room temperature. So once we do that, uh, those embryos would then be placed uh, inside that embryo freezer that it's gonna be set at a temperature of minus six. Um, after those embryos uh, stay in that minus six for about two minutes, 
uh, we're then allowed to go ahead and, and, and actually seed uh, those uh, embryo straws. And basically the process of seeding a, a, an embryo straw is when your embryologist is gonna go in and is actually gonna submerge a, a metal rod uh, in liquid nitrogen. And then he's gonna touch that straw to start uh, freezing that straw with that metal rod before actually turning in uh, the embryo freezing probe, okay? So once those straws are seeded, okay, um, three minutes after seeding, we're gonna be actually starting our freezing program. And then our freezing program for slow rate freezing is gonna be set at a, a half, C, uh, a half uh, de degree Celsius decrease per minute, ranging from minus six all the way to minus uh, 34.8 Celsius, okay? Uh, there's some flexibility with regards to the freezing rate. So that usually can range from 0.3 to 0.6 Celsius per minute. And once those embryos reach, uh, reach and then the freezing system uh, uh, program reaches uh, minus 34.8 Celsius, we're gonna be then able to plunge that embryo into liquid nitrogen. And then we're gonna be storing that embryo following very similar guidelines from what uh, Dr. Dalton just covered uh, with regards to semen storage and, and handling. And as I mentioned, when we're utilizing ethylene glycol, uh, the big thing about ethylene glycol is that it allows us to really simplify the thawing uh, of those embryos, right? So um, when we're thawing embryos, they are uh, frozen um, with uh, ethylene glycol. We're gonna actually remove those embryos following a very similar uh, protocol to what we do with semen. However, instead of placing those embryos directly in the thawing unit, we're actually gonna keep those embryos, uh, we're gonna do what we call air thawing those embryos for about five seconds, for five seconds. And then once we air thaw those embryos, we place those embryos for at least 20 seconds uh, in a water bath in a little bit of a, a cooler temperature of, of 90 Fahrenheit, okay? So you're gonna see some uh, differences when it comes to, uh, depending on, on where the person was trained. I've, I've worked with people that will put their temperature down all the way to 84, 86 Fahrenheit when they're uh, using direct transfer methods. And I've never worked with people that uh, use a 95 Fahrenheit, but I heard of, of, of embryologists that actually uh, will thaw their embryos at 95 Fahrenheit. I usually try to use, uh, that's uh, based on the training that I had, um, a 90 Fahrenheit water bath temperature. And we've been having some uh, uh, good results using this approach. Um, and then once we go there and, and, and thaw that embryo for 20 seconds, that embryo would then be, be, be dry with a paper towel and loaded in a specific embryo gun, which is very similar to an AI gun. The only difference is that embryo gun is a little bit um, longer. Um, and, a, and a little bit more flexible as well, since we're gonna be going all the way into the, into the uterus uh, as we think about the side of transfer. So usually for the transfer process, we're gonna go there and then either palpate or, or perform transrectal ultrasound to figure out which side that cow ovulated from, our recipient cow. Uh, we're gonna then do a local um, epidural anesthesia. And then once uh, we apply the anesthesia, we go there and we actually go in and deposit that embryo in the same, in the uterine horn in the same side or, or ipsilaterally to that uh, corpus luteum structure, okay? So after palpating and figuring out where, where that uh, cow ovulated from, which side we're gonna go in and, and, and go through that cervix. And as opposed to what uh, Dr. Dalton was saying, uh, that about what we do with semen, where we're depositing that uh, uh, semen in the body of the uterus. When you're going in and we're actually depositing an embryo in, we're going all the way uh, into the large curvature uh, of that uh, uterine horn. And that's why the process of transferring requires a lot of training, a lot of technique, because we know that the uterus is an extremely sensitive tissue, right? And any type of manipulation or excessive manipulation uh, can damage that endometrial tissue or induce a pro-inflammatory response that we know is gonna decrease pregnancy rate after transfer, okay? And that's when a lot of the art of, 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 of having good conception rates from a, from a technique of transferring standpoint comes into place. Uh, some of the common mistakes that we see people doing it, uh, you know, the further in we can go in the uterine horn, the better it is. 
But as long as we can do that without damaging the endometrium, right? As soon as we start manipulating and spending too much time within the uterus, uh, we start seeing a decrease in pregnancy rates. And there are actually studies that look into that where they time uh, how much the embryo technician uh, was spending inside the uterus. And they noticed that the more time they spend in the uterus, the lower uh, the pregnancy rates were. So, you know, if we're in a situation where based on the anatomy of the cow, if the cow has a, a uterine horn that is a little bit hard to go all the way to the tip of that horn, you know, we're better off depositing that embryo a little bit earlier. We're gonna have some pretty good pregnancy rates as long as we make it um, at least uh, to the beginning of the large curvature like I'm showing you here, uh, we should have some pretty good uh, results. You know, um, as we think about transferring those embryos, these are some, some of the things that we gotta be mindful of. Uh, minimize manipulation and minimize the risk of inducing any type of damage within that very sensitive um, endometrial tissue. So um, with that, um, I'll turn it uh, back to you, Vitor. I'll try to stop sharing. Did that work? Yes, thank you, Pedro. Right. Thank you, Vitor. I just want to make sure everybody's seeing my slides. Yes. All right, awesome. Okay, so Brett, very briefly, you know, after a lot more detailed presentation from Dr. Dalton and Dr. Fontes, just want to briefly touch on a couple of the tools that we have available uh, for towing embryo and, and, and semen in, in the bovine industry. And, you know, in reality, as we think about this, it's a very simple process, you know, towing semen uh, although a very critical process, it's a very simple process. So what, all we need is just a container that has um, water at the right temperature and that will hold that temperature for an adequate amount of time, which is at least the 30 to 40 seconds that it takes to thaw uh, the embryo or the semen straw. And, and in reality, that's all we need, right? Um, but as we do more cattle, for example, uh, as we're doing fixed time AI or doing time embryo transfer. Um, some of those, those um, units that um, are quite simple, a lot of times don't do a great job because we got to spend a lot of time making sure that we're adding more hot water to reach the same, uh, the adequate temperature. So, you know, if you're only breeding a couple cows or only transferring a few embryos, those units are quite okay and they work just fine and have been used for a long time with success. But again, if you're doing fixed time DI or time embryo transfer, you need to focus a little bit more on, on some of those other units, uh, which are electronic and, and do a tremendous job on keeping the temperature correctly and adding efficiency through the process. So I have three of the probably the most common units that are commercially available. So the site of Thaw Electric, it's very probably one of the most popular ones. Um, you know, all of them come with a wall plug as well as a cigarette lighter, right? Or the uh, AC unit for a vehicle and which make it a lot more uh, friendly to use as we're breeding cows in the middle of the pasture, for example, um, not necessarily always close to, to a facility that has electricity. And some of the other units also now have, uh, actually are battery powered um, and can hold uh, battery charge for quite a while um, and can be very mobile because of that. So we have the Cytotol Electric, uh, the WTA unit, and then the Dairy Mac as well. And I believe the Dairy Mac um, is the only one that has the, the battery. So they all work really nicely. Um, I believe the WTA only offers a temperature in Celsius. So you want to make sure that you understand that. Um, that you're not thinking that it's 35 uh, Fahrenheit. It's actually 35 Celsius. Um, and, and both the WTA and the Dairy Mac have a little timer, which is pretty handy, you know, to make sure that um, the timer is built into the machine to make sure that you're not um, leaving the semen uh, for too little or the embryo straw and for too little inside of that bath. But really importantly, whatever it is that you're using, you know, check the temperature, you know, trust that the technology, but check the temperature. And there's some very simple uh, thermometers that work really nicely. 
the little like thermonic card that we can stick and keep it inside the water bath as, as you're towing semen and embryos, as well as on the dial uh, thermometers. And they work really nicely. And um, it's a kind of a, you know, insurance policy, if you will, to make sure that um, the temperature is correct. And um, we, we're doing the best we can uh, to, to, you know, add efficiency to this process, okay? So, you know, so, so bottom line is, you know, keep it clean. Um, if you've been around um, a lot of the facilities, you know, it, it gets, it's easy to get things dirty when we're working cattle. Uh, so I really recommend, you know, keeping the outside and the inside as clean as possible. I really might like to, you know, drain after every use and then add new water, new clean water, as we're going to uh, bring more cows the next day or the next week or transfer more embryos. Um, I really don't like the idea of actually uh, keeping water constantly, keeping those units plugged constantly. I think it's important to, to get new water there, make sure it's clean every time you're going to use it, okay? Um, and then we don't store it correctly, right? We want to make sure that we put it in a place that's safe and it's going to uh, keep the integrity of the unit uh, so that we we'll avoid problems later. And, you know, those units are very hardy and kind of heavy duty. They can take some abuse, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's an investment, right, that you make on some of those units. They're usually around $100 to $150, um, if I'm not mistaken. So you want to make sure that we're taking good care of them. But again, you know, check the temperature. Use the technology, um, those, those machines work really nicely and have really improved efficiency of, of doing fixed time AI and ember transfer. But, you know, check the temperature. And, you know, once you do all that, you know, go get some cows pregnant, okay? So um, trying to keep it short and sweet, I'm gonna uh, invite back Dr. Fontes and Dr. Dalton. Uh, to answer some of the questions that you guys have. Um, so please, again, remember to type them in the Q&A session here tab of uh, Zoom, and we'll, we'll try and answer as many as we can. So, Joe, I think I'm gonna start with you. You have some questions here. Um, okay. About, does the time, um, of towing, I imagine, decrease when you're using a quarter cc versus a half cc straw of semen? Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of thought along those lines. But actually, um, thawing recommendations are the same for when we're thawing semen, whether it's packaged in quarters or halves, in 0.25 or 0.5 mil straws. So we would still wanna be um, 95, 98 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 to 37 degrees Celsius for about 45 seconds. Okay. And, um, you know, some questions, a lot of questions about the quarter CC. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a question that I get asked a lot of time and, you know, better feel free to, to jump in here, uh, but we, I always get asked, you know, is there a difference in fertility between a quarter cc and a half cc? Uh, is it different in, in cell um, numbers or sperm numbers? And would that, you know, then cause any differences in, in fertility? Can you talk about that, Joe? Yeah, so there was a meta-analysis done of thousands of straws and fertility of the, of the straws, both uh, 0.25 compared to 0.5. Uh, and this was done by Jeff Stevenson at Kansas State, published Journal of Dairy Science, also published in Hordes Dairyman and other popular uh, publications. Essentially, there is, there is little to no advantage. It's approximately one percentage point or a little bit less than one percentage point um, uh, in fertility between the two in favor slightly of the quarter cc straw or the 0.25, okay? So really what the data shows is that fertility suffers when poor semen handlers use the 0.25 straw as compared to the half mil straw. 
So there's actually an you're you're adding insult to the smaller package size or the smaller package size is more sensitive to insult. Let's put it that way. The smaller package size is more sensitive to insult. And if I have poor handling techniques, I actually get lower fertility with the 0.25 and markedly lower because the 0.5 is actually a little more and the words little, a little more forgiving. So the idea here is essentially fertility is the same, essentially, so long as we use very good semen handling techniques. Perfect. Um, Pedro, there's a question. Um, is there a significant difference in pregnancy rate de derived from embryos um, from a conventional flush versus IVF embryos? Yeah, that's 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 a great question, uh, and there is um, usually embryos they're generated through conventional superovulation following flushes. Um, they tend to have a better fertility when you compare it to in vitro produced embryos. Now, not only a fertility better fertility when you go there and preg check them, let's say they 30, 35 of gestation, but also between that first preg check and let's say our second preg check that we're going to do around day 60, 100, those IVF embryos tend to, uh, those cows that become pregnant to an IVF embryo, they tend to lose more as well. Uh, so from a from a survival within the female reproductive tract, uh, the fresh embryos do better than, um, than in vitro produce. Um, what percentage difference? Well, that would depend, uh, but it's usually about a 10% uh, difference um, with fresh IVF embryos. Perfect. Um, you know, there's a question about using distilled water or just regular tap water um, in the TAW units. And you know, I'm not aware of any uh, data that shows you know, a need to use distilled water uh, on those units. You know, it really, if there's no contact of the water uh, with the semen, right? Which is protected uh, we're in the plastic straw and then, you know, you're cutting the straw after you remove it, you actually dry it on the paper sheet. So it really doesn't have any effect. Uh, you can use any kind of water, um, but, but again, just any clean type of water um, and it should be fine. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a question about um, the, some of the semen extender, uh, really difference between the glycerol or ethanoglycol. Etin if there's any differences, um, Joe, perhaps you can try and answer that. So there, there are differences between extenders and e extender components. There are components that uh, utilize egg yolk, egg yolk citrate and tris as a buffer. Um, they uh, utilize glycerol. Um, there are some that do not that are, that are plant-based, okay? There are some that are one-step mixing or the dilution occurs in one step. There are some that are two-step, okay? Having said that, the system that needs to be used or that is used needs to fit the procedures that are being used at the AI center and the type of freezing mechanism that is being done, whether it's a programmable freezer, whether it's not a programmable freezer, uh, et cetera. There are many different ways within the rules, if you will, and components that you could use to freeze semen. Milk-based milk -based extenders are used by some of the very largest AI cooperatives. Having said that, they're all optimized for their freezing procedures to provide the producer with the best chance at fertility. There was a question earlier, uh, I know, Joe, that you actually typed the answer. I just want to, I want to read it out loud and, and then answer mm -hmm. as well. And it was asking about 
um, whether or not those thermometer cards go bad after a while. Um, and I'm, I don't think I've ever seen one go bad. <laughs> um, they last a long time if they take good care of them. And I think you know, going back to that idea of actually draining the water, keep it dry and then store it correctly uh, after each use uh, will, will make those things really last for a long time. So kind of kind of wanted to touch touch on that. That was an interesting um, interesting question. So um, are you guys aware of any advantage of using different types of, of gun sheaths, uh, like those plastic sheaths for AI or embryo? Pick on you, Pedro, I guess. <laughs> Pedro, you go first. Yes, um, I'm not aware of any um, um, any considerable differences with regards to leading to actually differences in pregnancy rates. Uh, there are some preferences. Um, some people like to buy those pre-packaged. Uh, so it, every time we're transferring embryos as opposed to AI, we're uh, always using a, a protective sheath, on, uh, a chemise, right? Some people call it a chemise, which is that second layer of plastic. Some people like to buy the, um, the embryo transfer sheath already with one of those chemises. Um, I personally don't have a preference. Uh, I wouldn't expect them to result in any differences in pregnancy rates. Ultimately, it's mostly uh, preference of the embryo technician. What about AI, Joe? Yeah, I think for AI, really the take home message is the sheath needs to match the gun. And if we're using a spiral gun or a gun that has a raised portion near where we're uh, manipulating it with our fingers, then you would wanna use the sheath that is not split. But if you go back into the dark ages, when I learned how to AI, we used O-rings and mm -hmm. O-ring guns. Well, O-ring guns require uh, sheaths that need to be split. Now, there are new technologies out there. There's a new gun that's being marketed that essentially has like a clip on the end and you can use different types of sheets. So that the idea there is to use multiple types of sheet. That works fine also. But the take home for me is I've finally gotten into the 2000s and I'm using a spiral gun now. So I'm using a closed sheet. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, the other thing that we'll add, uh, especially talk a lot about the quarter CC versus half CC uh, straws. And especially some of the older guns are not um, ideal for quarter CC. So you gotta be, and you know, people don't notice that until like the, actually the plunger starts going to the side of the straw and it's very frustrating. <laughs> And all of a sudden you're wasting a lot of uh, semen straw. So you want to make sure that whatever gun you're using is also, you know, appropriate for the sheath that you have and also the semen straw that you um, that you have in hand. Um, on that, that same topic, uh, there's a question about startup AI uh, equipment. And, you know, you guys feel free to jump in here, but there are a lot of very cool uh, kits now that you can buy online that you know, have a toolbox with a couple guns, uh, you know, tweezers, the cutters, the top box unit already in there. Pretty much, you know, any, all the equipment that you, that you need and a really neat way to keep things stored nicely cleaned. And uh, so there's a couple options. I think every you know, semen company, you know, those, those tire, um, Companies, they have their own to sell. There's some on Amazon even you can buy. So there's a lot of options there. Um, but in essence, what you need is a falling unit. Could be a, an automatic one or it could be just a manual one. A couple guns uh, or even just one gun and, um, you know, the, the cutter and everything else um, you, you can buy as you, as you go. 
Um, the tweezers kind of recommend that. Uh, otherwise, you get, especially if you're doing a lot of semen, you get uh, some blisters pretty quickly. You learn uh, to like make sure that your hands are dry first. Um, and if, if you don't, you're going to learn pretty quickly that liquid nitrogen really burns quickly. So, um, but yeah, um, you, you don't need to go very fancy. You can buy things separately, uh, but I would recommend buying some of those kits because they're really ready to go. Um, there's another question about the quarter versus half CC straws, uh, Joe, I'm gonna ask you, is there twice as much semen in the half CC versus the quarter CC? Okay, this is a great question. And no, actually there's not. The benefit of the quarter CC straw is that what you're doing is you're, you're, you're supplying the same number of sperm you would in a half CC dose, but by virtue of the different design, the surface to um, content or volume ratio smaller, you can actually use less extender and still achieve similar post-thaw survival rates. So it's actually an engineering um, feat, if you will, that allows us to go the same number of sperm from a half mil straw and put it in a quarter mil straw and we use less diluent or less extender but we achieve similar fertility and similar post-thaw uh, motility, viability, et cetera, all those types of things. So no, uh, it's a common mis misconception that there's less sperm. There's not. Thank you. And the last question we have here in the Q&A, um, you know, asking about some people do for 45 seconds, the semen thawing, some people do for 60 seconds. It does those, are those, does that make a lot of difference, those 15 seconds? Joe, I'll, I'll give that to you again. No, I would say, I would say that, that 45 seconds has become the recommendation over time. Uh, is there an issue if you're at 40 seconds or you're at 55 or something like that? No. If you're at extended times, the issue becomes the thaw bath water loses across time, loses temperature, okay? So that would be an issue. So if you're talking minutes, then there is an issue. On the other hand, if you're thawing for 10 seconds, you're not allowing for a complete warm water thaw. So 45 seconds, the rule of thumb, but if you're gonna go 40 to 60, you'll be fine. Perfect. Um, I want to thank uh, Pedro, Joe, again, for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for everyone to sign up. Again, you know, it's really awesome to see a lot of people showing up for these webinars. Uh, it's the reason why we keep it going. Um, and thanks for Merck for sponsoring uh, the Beef Reproduction Task Force and sponsoring those webinars. Uh, I want to remind that ev to everyone that this is being recorded and will be offered on, on your YouTube channel. Um, and our next and last uh, webinar of this spring is going to be on May 17 with Dr. George Perry talking about vaccination protocols uh, for fertility. Okay, so thank you again, everybody. I uh, think Joe, thank Pedro. Guys, have a good night, and we'll see you in a month. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.